Hello, welcome to this lecture. Today we'll be doing skeletal muscle anatomy and contraction. So let's get started. So let's take an example of our bicep muscles. A muscle is made up of many fascicles. One fascicle is made up of many muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are muscle cells. So what does come into mind when you talk about cells? Nucleus, cytoplasm, mitochondria, etc. right? One muscle fiber is made up of many myofibrils, and one myofibril is made up of many myofilaments. So let's go through them one by one. So let's look at this guy. They're looking at his deltoid muscles. Um, and you could see this is the entire muscle, okay? And one muscle, as I said, has many fascicles, right? So this is one fascicle. So you can look, there's one fascicle here, one here, one here, one here. Okay, one fascicle is made up of many muscle fibers, which you could see there are many here. And as I said, muscle fibers are also known as muscle cells. Okay, so there's a nucleus. I'll show, I have another diagram here. Yes, you could see this is a muscle fiber, and you could see the nucleus here. You could see the mitochondria here, you know, muscle, muscles contract, right? So we need mitochondria to produce ATP which will go into detail why mitochondria is required um, during muscle contraction for the actin and myosin, okay? So yeah, this is the muscle fiber, and one muscle fiber is made up of many myofibrils, okay? Myofibrils, they contain something known as myofilaments. You could see the blue ones here are known as thin filaments and the thick ones here are known as thick filaments the thick ones are made up of myosin and the thin ones are made up of actin we'll go through that um, very soon when we're talking about sarcomere so a muscle made up of many fascicles one fascicle is made up of many muscle fibers which are muscle cells one muscle fiber is made up of many myofibrils and one myofibril is made up of many myofilaments okay which can be divided into thick and thin filaments and as i said the thin filament is actin which normally is represented by blue color in many diagrams and the thick filament is myosin and before we move on to the sarcomere section the thick filaments is the reason why it's actually dark we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that um, in a bit and that's the a band which is actually dark and the thin filaments is the reason why it's really light because you know it's thin right so it, may, it it's lighter than when it's thick so that is actually the i band so we'll go to that very very soon before that as i said myofibrils many 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 myofibrils make up a muscle fiber right a sarcomere is the structure unit of a myofiber okay we'll go through what a sarcomere is but this is a sarcomere and this entire thing is a myofibril okay so a sarcomere is a structure unit of a myofibril and you can see this is the actin uh this is the myosin and you will we will talk about a and i bands and h bands and etc so as i said the sarcomere is the structure unit of a myofibril and this is the detailed diagram of a sarcomere as i said before there are many myofilaments that make up a myofibril and the myofilaments are the thin filaments which is normally represented by blue in many diagrams and the thick filaments which is this myosin right here now we can know we can infer that thin filaments and thick filaments obviously the thin filaments would be lighter right and the thick filaments would be darker so the area where there is both myosin and actin present we call it as the a band the a band okay the area where is only the thin filaments present or where only the actin is present we call it the i band okay and in the middle where only the myosin is present is called the h band now how do we remember this um you could see in i band there's a letter i right and there's a letter i in the word light in the A band, which is right here, the le there's a letter A, and there's the letter A in the word dark. So 
A band is dark because it has letter A, and I band is light because it has a letter I in it. Okay, so look, A band has a letter A, and dark has a letter A, so it's darker. I band has a letter I in the word light, so it's lighter. Okay, you could look at the electron microscopy of um, the sarcomere. Let's see where is the I band and the A band here. So this is light, right? This region is light. So that's the I band. I for light, so I band, okay? This region here is darker than the rest, right? So that's dark, has a letter A, so it's the A band. And you can see this exactly this region here is the H band, okay? Now, the lines that separate a sarcomere from other sarcomeres is known as the Z line, okay? So this this one from one Z line to the other Z line is one sarcomere, okay? And the middle line is called as an M line, okay? So yeah, that's the structure unit of a myofibrous. The, the, the structure of a, a sarcomere is very simple. Again, let's just say, let's just repeat, the band, which is only actin is present, it's lighter, so it's called an I band. The area where both, um, myosin and actin is present, it's called an A band because you know it's dark, so dark for A band. And the middle where only the myosin is present, that's the H band, okay? And the, and the lines of the sarcomere, the middle line is called the M line. And what makes up one sarcomere is the, the distance between two Z lines, okay? Next is about muscle contraction. And how muscle contraction happens is, is just the actin pulls along the myosin. The actin pulls along the myosin by the use of ATP. And that's why the muscle fibers, they have a lot of mitochondria to, to produce that ATP for muscle contraction, right? So they pull along the actin uh, filament and the muscle becomes shorter and shorter. So if you flex your bicep, you can notice that it, could, it will become shorter because the sarcomere becomes shorter. So that means the distance of the I band decreases and the distance of the H band decreases, right? Does that make sense? Because the myosin is pulling along the actin, you could see that more of the actin would move into the myosin, right? That's why the distance of the I band actually decreases. The H band also decreases. You could see, you could see the difference here. The H band, the length of the H band decreases, but the A band, the A band, the length never decreases. Okay, during muscle contraction, the A band length never decreases. We'll write this down. Which ones? Which one of the bands uh, would decrease in the muscle contraction section? But yeah, I'm just briefly explaining explaining it right now. So, muscle contraction or the sliding filament theory. This is a diagram that I took from Wikipedia. Um. So let's go through it uh, step by step. So there are basically four stages and we'll take this as our first stage. It's basically a cycle. So when you come to the last stage, it goes back to the first and it's just a cycle. And that's how muscle contraction and relaxation happens. So let's look at this stage. If you remember in my neurotransmission to muscles lecture, we explain that how the L-type um, CA2 plus channel, they mechanically interact with the ryanodin receptor, which allows CA2 plus to exit the sarcoplasm reticulum to bind to the troponin C, right? And once the CA2 plus ions bind to troponin C, it moves away the tropomyosin, exposing the acting, allowing it to bind to myosin, right? We learned this in our um, neurotransmission to muscles lecture. So you could see that these are those calcium ions, Ca2 plus ions. And this right here is our troponin C. And this right here, this, this orange band, is our tropomyosin. These green subunits are the actin, and this is the myosin, right? So let's just start with this complex, which the myosin is already attached to um, the actin. So we can say 
as Ca2 plus binds to troponin C, the tropomyosin is removed from the actin, allowing the myosin ADP plus phosphate complex to bind to the actin. So let's write that down. So now let's go to the next part of muscle contractions or the next step of muscle contraction. After the calcium is bind it to the troponin C. I said that uh, the myosin can bind to the actin, right? Once it's removed, the tropomyosin will be removed from the actin, allowing myosin ADP plus phosphate complex to bind to the actin. Now, how does it pull? How does it pull along the, along the actin filament so that the sarcomere can become shorter to allow muscle contraction? It happens when the ADP plus phosphate complex is released okay so once bound once the myosin is bound to the actin the adp plus phosphate complex is released is released from the myosin resulting in shortening of the sarcomere and ultimately muscle contraction occurs okay so let's write that down so the adp plus phosphate complex is removed or it gets released from the myosin and it allows muscle contraction right so this is where i said the myosin kind of pulls along um the actin filament and that's how the sarcomere the length of the sarcomere actually decreases you could see the length of the sarcomere you could see it decreased right the length of the sarcomere has decreased and that's why i said since the actin is going towards um, or the myosin is going towards the actin, or the actin is going towards the myosin, the length of the I-band would decrease, right? Because I said I-band is the region where it's only the actin filaments, where it's light, right? So the length of the I-band, it would decrease. There's another actin here, by the way. There are many sarcomeres, okay? There are many, many sarcomeres. It's just showing one section of the sarcomere. There's another actin here, and there's another myosin that starts from here. The length of the I-band would decrease, and the length of the H-band would decrease because, as I said, H-band is a region where only myosin is present, right? Only myosin is present. So if the actin is moving towards the center, the actin is moving towards the center, the distance here where the myosin is, or only myosin is present, it would decrease, right? Because the actin is moving closer and closer during contraction. So the length of the H-band decreases, but the A-band, where the this entire region here basically the length of the thick filament is the a band okay the length of the between two thick filaments is the a band that never decreases because the length of the thick filaments does not decrease right how, how could it decrease during muscle contraction so you could see this is a very good diagram comparing the lengths of each band so let me just repeat i band length decreases h band length decreases a band length remains the same okay i hope you understood why the a band remains the same because it's the length between two thick filaments and the that length how it, there's no way that there's no possibility that it would decrease so that's why the length of the a band does not decrease so let's write that down so the I band decreases, the H band decreases, and the length of the A band remains the same. And we can write here that this is during contraction. So yeah, that was when the ADP and phosphate group um, it gets released from the myosin, causing you could see there's this power stroke causing the myosin to allowing it to be pulled along the actin filament, and that's how the sarcomere. Um, the length of the sarcomere decreases. If you try to flex your bicep, you could see that, try it right now with me, you could see that um, the length of the bicep actually decreases because the sarcomere is becoming shorter. So yeah, that is about muscle contraction. Now let's look at relaxation, okay? So now, once that uh, ADP and phosphate group or complex gets released from the myosin, a new ATP, which is produced from mitochondria, it binds to the myosin. Remember that it's still, the myosin is still attached to uh, the 
actin. Okay, so once a new ATP is attached to the myosin, the myosin cross bridge is detached. Okay, and that is basically muscle relaxation. So the ATP attaches to the myosin and the myosin head detaches. Okay. So for this one, when this was released, the ADP and phosphate complex was released, it pulls the uh, actin filament. It pulls along the actin filament, right? And it's still attached. Uh, it's still attached. The myosin is still attached to the actin. When a new ATP binds to the myosin, that's when uh, it gets detached from the actin filament. And this is how uh, um, muscle relaxation happens. This is this facilitates muscle relaxation. And the last part is when this ATP complex, it hydrolyzes, okay? It hydrolyzes into, again, ADP and phosphate complex. And that is basically the first step again, which is here. That is basically the first step again. ADP is hydrolyzed, re resulting in something called caulking of the myosin ADP and P complex. Caulking means just something which is kind of abruptly shifts to one side. So I'll show you a diagram for this. You could see once that ATP is hydrolyzed into again ADP and phosphate, there's this caulking of the myosin head, meaning once it detaches, it goes into its original state where it just suddenly pulls and again it can perform muscle contraction, which is back to step one. Okay. So let's just write it down. Clear? Yeah. After this, it goes back to the first step again, which is this. Um, once calcium ions can bind to the troponin C, it would move the tropomyosin so that the myosin can attach to the actin, right? And that's how it goes to step one again. Let's just quickly go through again what is the muscle contraction or the sliding filament theory. Step one was when calcium ions bind to the troponin C. The tropomyosin is removed from the actin filament, allowing the myosin ADP plus P complex to bind to the actin, right? It binds to the actin. Once that complex is released, the ADP plus P complex is released, it results in shortening of the sarcomere, ultimately causing muscle contraction. It pulls, it pulls along um, the actin filament, and that's how, as I said, you see, it pulls along the actin filament. It, it pulls like this along the actin filament, and that's how the I band length decreases, the H band length decreases, but the length of the A band remains the same, okay? And I wrote that down here too. I band, H band, and A band during contraction. When it's already released, right? The ADP plus P complex is released. When a new ATP complex binds to the myosin. It results in the myosin detaching from the actin. And when this is hydrolyzed, when this ATP is hydrolyzed, it results in the caulking of the myosin head, meaning just abruptly moving from one side to the other. So that's how it goes back to step one again. And once uh, once calcium ions can bind to the troponin C, it moves the tropomyosin, and that's how the myosin ADP plus P complex, right? ADP plus P complex, remember? In this, there's the ADP plus P complex. That same one, it goes back from fourth step to first step, okay? The ATP plus P complex, it binds back to the actin, causing further um, sliding of the actin into the middle, okay? And that's how uh, muscle contraction happens. And this is the sliding filament theory. And that's it. And th that was muscle contraction, I hope me writing all this and you going through it again and again would make you understand the sliding filament theory, okay? okay. So let me try to explain isotonic and isometric um, contractions with an example. So if you remember in your physics classes in your high school, we learned thermodynamics, right? And there's a process called an isothermal process. What is isothermal process? It's a system where temperature is a constant, right? Temperature does not change. That means the word isothermal the word iso, it means same, okay? Thermal is temperature, so iso, thermal, temperature is constant. So isotonic and isometric, meaning the tonic part and the metric part is 
the same. It does not change. It's a constant. What is tonic? Tonic basically means tension. Okay, it's how much weight you're lifting. Okay, and metric means length, right? Distance. Distance does not change. So the tension one isotonic is the tension does not change. Isometric is the distance does not change. So let's look at isotonic first. I have my trusted uh, gym water bottle. If you didn't know, water is actually really heavy. So if you lift a huge bottle of water, it's quite heavy. But anyway, we are not changing the weight of the water bottle because the amount of water is not decreasing, right? So this is isotonic, meaning the weight does not change. Now let's look at an isotonic contraction. So if you look at my bicep, when you're flexing, this is called concentric contraction. When you're re relaxing, this is called eccentric contraction, okay? So if the weight is the same, the tension would be the same, right? The tension would not increase. How could it increase if the weight remains the same? So this is called an isotonic contraction, okay? Look, isotonic contraction. Try lift something really heavy and try it with me right now, okay? I'll wait for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's do it together. If you if you hold something really heavy, you could see that the bicep is already with a lot of tension, right? And you're doing concentric, eccentric, concentric, eccentric. The tension of the bi bicep, it, it remains the same. It does not change. So this is called an isotonic, okay? Isotonic contraction. The tension remains the same. Now, what about an isometric contraction? An isometric contraction is the distance does not change. So let's take the same water bottle and let's just hold it like this. Now, just imagine that this water bottle is empty, okay? And I'm not flexing or I'm not doing concentric um, contraction or eccentric contraction, okay? I'm just holding this empty water bottle. Just imagine this is empty. Now, as I'm pouring water into the water bottle, the weight of the water increases, right? That means my the tension of my bicep would increase since the weight is increasing. So that is an isometric contraction, okay? As I pour more water, so there's an empty water bottle. As I pour more water into um, my water bottle, the weight of the water bottle would increase, right? That means the more weight that, um, the more weight that it would increase, the more work that my bicep has to do. That means the tension of the bicep would increase, right? And that causes a little bit of contraction compared to um, when you're actually flexing your bicep, okay? So let's look at the diagram that I was going to show you. So this is that diagram. You could see this guy right here is doing a concentric contraction. As I said, concentric, eccentric, right? He's doing a concentric contraction. And you could see what he's holding, the weight is the same, right? So the tension of his bicep remains the same. So that's why it's called an isotonic, okay? So let's just write down that this tonic is tension, okay? So that means the weight does not change. The tension of the bicep remains the same and it contracts and it relaxes or it elongates, okay? So that's isotonic contraction. It's pretty simple. The weight does not change. Now let's look at isometric. It does not change the weight, but still, let's imagine that it's a water bottle and you're pouring water. You're pouring water into your water bottle and you're just holding it like this, okay? He's just holding it. There's no movement of the joint, okay? There's no movement of the joints. So that's an isometric contraction, okay? You're not moving the bicep, right? You're, 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 not you're not flexing or you're not contracting or you're not elongating, okay? So there's an isometric contraction, but you could still see it still contracts. Why? Because you're holding it. It's a heavy object. So the bicep does need to contract so that it can continue holding the um, the weight, right? Whether it's a water bottle, whether it's this dumbbell. So that's an isometric contraction, okay? It still contracts because of that constant tension that you're holding or that constant water bottle or this dumbbell that you're holding. So yeah, hope you understood uh, what an isotonic and what an isometric contraction is. So it's pretty simple. Now, for tetanus, this is the graph that we will use to explain what tetanus is. Tetanus is very, very easy to understand. This is the period where it's called tetanus. But let's see from the start. 
So you could see when there is one spike of action potential, this is the force of contraction. So that's basically our muscles, okay? The muscle just contracts and relaxes, okay? This is contraction and this is relaxation, okay? The force of the contraction increases, that's contraction, and it decreases relaxation, okay? And, then, and that's for one um, action potential. And that is called a single twitch. There's a single twitch of um, the muscle, okay? Now, if you have more than one, action potential, meaning the signal is a little bit more stronger than the previous one, you would have two waves, right? It contracts because of this. And before it finish, finishes relaxing, there's another action potential. And that's why it contracts even more. So that's why this is known as the wave summation. It's the sum of waves, okay? So you could see it contracts and it starts to relax, but there's another action potential. And it contracts again, but there is there is no more action potential, so it relaxes to rest. So that is called wave summation. This is the same. This is the same. This is also known as a wave summation. Contracts, starts to relax, but then there's another action potential. Contracts, and this is a wave summation, or known as unfused tetanus. So what is a tetanus? A tetanus is when there are multiple action potentials. The multiple action potentials. And these action potential is sustained, is sustained for a period of time, right? It's sustained for a period of time. And that will produce a maximum force, right? That would produce a maximum force for a sustained period of time. And this is known as a tetanus. Okay, it's very simple to understand. This is when multiple um remember when I said there are multiple muscles, right? And so there are multiple fascicles, right? Of the muscle. This is when multiple fascicles of the muscle is stimulated together and that's how a maximum force is generated when action potential to the muscle is sustained for a period of time okay for a period of time and this region here is called a tetanus okay very simple to understand um, when there's a single put action potential the wave it just contracts and relaxes that is a single twitch when there are two or three or four action potentials there's, a, there's something called a wave summation. But when action potential is sustained for a period of time, it produces a maximum force, and that is known as a tetanus. So let's write that down. Actually, tetanus is a bacterial infection that causes muscle spasms, but uh, <laughs> this is another definition for it, where uh, when an action potential is, when a muscle fiber is stimulated by many action potentials, many action potentials for a sustained period of time for a sustained period of time producing a maximum force that is known as a tetanus okay so let's just summarize our lecture for muscle anatomy and contraction so we know that the skeletal muscle one muscle is made up of many fascicles one fascicle is made up of many muscle fibers and also known as a muscle cell one muscle cell is made of many myofibrils and one myofibril is made of many myofilaments which is the thin filaments which are the actin and the thick filaments which is the myosin right and we saw the example this is a muscle and this one right here is a fascicle one small inside here is a muscle fiber which is also known as a muscle cell and inside this is the myofibril and these are the myofilaments okay and we know that the sac sarcomere is the structural unit of a myofibril and we learned the z line the thin filaments which is um, the i band right which is the actin filaments and the thick filaments which is right here which is the a band which is the myosin right we learned muscle contraction how uh, what happens in each step which is very very easy i wrote this down which is very, very easy to understand. During contraction, the I band decreases, the H band decreases, then the A band remains the same, right? It makes sense. The actin filament moves towards the center. So the I band, it moves towards the myosin, right? So the I band, the length of the I band decreases. The length of the H band also decreases because the actin is moving closer to the center, right? The actin is moving closer to the center. So the length of the H band also decreases, but the length of the A band, you could see in this diagram, it remains the same, right? Because the length of the biosin does not decrease, right? It remains the same, whether it's relaxed or contracted. 
And so yeah, um, the length of the A band remains the same during contraction. And then we looked at isotonic contraction, which is uh, when you're moving your uh, heavy weight, concentric and eccentric contraction, and you're moving your joint, right? And for isometric is when you're just holding the weight at a constant position and you're either increasing or decreasing the weight and you could see that it affects the tension of um, the bicep. And we looked at tetanus where multiple action potentials for a sustained period of time causes the production of a maximum force that is known as a tetanus. So yeah, if um, you have any questions, you could just comment down in this video or if you have any personal questions which are which need um, deep discussion, you could just DM me into my Instagram page at dsr.manav at dsr.manav and uh, whatever notes that I made in this um, lecture, I'll be posting it in the Google Drive forward link, which will be in the description and the comment section. Um, so yeah, I hope this lecture helped and I hope it was easy to understand muscle anatomy and contraction. Um, I hope you have a great day. That's it. Bye-bye. <laughs>